It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. More recently I saw an interview that was done with Richard Dawkins about the substitutional hypothesis, and I found it to be incredibly interesting. And so, without further hesitation, let's react to the whole entire video clip. And one of the things that I noticed since maybe 2013, maybe 2012, was that as religiosity decreased, deranged woke beliefs increased. And I guess my first question to you is, uh, I, I don't know who came up with this. I might have come up with this. I don't know who came up with this, but the substitution hypothesis. Yes. So, so do you think, and I honestly do not know the answer to this question, do you think that as one religion fades, another, like default is the belief state for humans. They just have to believe something. And, and as one, as the old religion fades, a new one has to come in? Yeah. Gullibility expands to fill the vacuum. Exactly. Something. Yeah. Precisely. I, I, I suppose that's right. I hadn't really thought of it before, but um, it sounds plausible to me. Um, I think G.K. Chesterton, who was a very religious man, right. um, said when people stop believing in God, they they believe in anything. Yeah. Um, and um, he was a very witty, clever man, although he was a devout Roman Catholic. Yeah. Um, there's something in it, I think, and there's no doubt about it that um, we are having, we seem to have exchanged one form of superstitious religiosity for another. As you guys know, I have criticized many social justice activists throughout the years. I have over 200 videos just talking about this particular issue, and also throughout the years, I criticized those that are very much dogmatic when it comes down to the Abrahamic faith. So I guess the question then becomes, what exactly is the alternative to actually stop this idea of the substitutional hypothesis? What can we actually do to prevent this from happening? I have at least two different answers for this particular case, because I feel as though that more than one answer is needed for this particular issue. I think a very simple solution is to actually make sure that we have critical thinking classes for students and kids. And particularly outside of school, I think it's also really important that many different parents engage in ideas that evolve critical thinking. And so allow the kid to actually question about why did they believe in something and why, get them to have like answer for things, and also to test out why they believe certain things. That is one thing. Another idea I have is to introduce the idea of logic because in many videos I react to, either it's like, you know, religious or secular, it seems as though that they have a lack of logic when it comes down to their own personal argumentation. That's like another solution. And also for a day-to-day -day conversation, I feel as though that we definitely need a Socratic method to actually have conversation. Because one thing that many people lack in nowadays is exposure to philosophy. And I think one of the greatest philosophers of all time is by far Socrates. So introduce Socrates to kids, introduce them to the ideas of the Socratic method. That way they can actually be prepared for like critical thinking and why they believe what they believe. Another thing that can also help us out when it comes down to these ideas is to also focus more about the community. One thing that churches have done really well throughout the years is to build a sense of community. If we can have like, you know, more construction of community centers and placement of that, I think that'd be a good idea, largely because for the case of community center, you don't have to have to worry about subscribing to ideas or dogmas, not to mention there are various kind of people you can make friends, you have to do like a lot of sports at community centers, or play video games in community centers. And so I think an emphasis on community can also help out really well. And I guess the other solution that I also have when it comes to this particular issue is to make sure that the teachers are not necessarily ideologically driven. If the teachers are ideologically driven, we should make sure that they don't have a job at all and make sure that they're really neutral when it comes to the particular topics and not have a political bias whatsoever. 
and responds to right-wing commentators that say that we need Christianity as a substitute for what's happening right now. Here are my own personal responses and suggestions for that to happen if it really is the case that we cannot do anything else outside of secular ideas. The first thing I would suggest for you guys is to make sure that you guys actually allow questioning to happen. Too many people who were part of the Christian faith have reported that every single time they ask too many questions, they get kicked out from the Sunday school. And so you need to actually prevent the idea of actually encouraging questioning a particular religious denomination. That way, people can actually, you know, become critical once they get older in life. That's one solution right there. My second suggestion is to get rid of the doctrine of hellfire. Because within the text itself, it uses Sheol, it uses Hades, Gehenna, as well as Tartarus. Now, for the case of Sheol, it refers to a Jewish underground. Hades was actually a place in Greek mythology that referred to souls being judged no matter their background. It was not a place at all for eternal torture. And Tartarus actually referred to, of course, a place where all the gods, no matter their background, burn forever. It was not necessarily a place where humans actually burn. When Jesus talked about Gehenna, it was actually a place that was like a burning trash pit. And also there was also child sacrifice. But nowhere is not necessarily talking about the issue of people burning forever and ever and ever. As a matter of fact, the idea of people burning forever and ever comes directly from a person named St. Augustine, who came up with this idea of internal torment. But sometimes also last, as the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things which offend, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of his Father. And that, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And though we have not room to cite instances, any one who examines the prophets will find that they adopt now the one arrangement and now the other. My own reason for following the latter order I have given. 2. Whether it is possible for bodies to last forever in burning fire. What, then, can I adduce to convince those who refuse to believe that human bodies, animated and living, can not only survive death, but also last in the torments of everlasting fires. They will not allow us to refer this simply to the power of the Almighty, but demand that we persuade them by some example. If, then, we reply to them that there are animals which certainly are corruptible, because they are mortal, and which yet live in the midst of flames, and likewise that in springs of water so hot that no one can put his hand in it with impunity, a species of worm is found, which not only lives there, but cannot live elsewhere. They either refuse to believe these facts unless we can show them, or, if we are in circumstances to prove them by ocular demonstration or by adequate testimony, they contend, with the same scepticism, that these facts are not examples of what we seek to prove, inasmuch as these animals do not live forever, and besides, they live in that blaze of heat without pain, the element of fire being congenial to their nature, and causing it to thrive and not to suffer. Just as if it were not more incredible that it should thrive than that it should suffer in such circumstances. It is strange that anything should suffer in fire and yet live, but stranger that it should live in fire and not suffer. If, then, the latter be believed, why not also the former? 3. Whether bodily suffering necessarily terminates in the destruction of the flesh. But, say they, there is no body which can suffer and cannot also die. How do we know this? For who can say with certainty that the devils do not suffer in their bodies when they own that they are grievously tormented? And if it is replied that there is no earthly body, that is to say, no solid and perceptible body, or, in one word, no flesh, which can suffer and cannot die, 
Is not this to tell us only what men have gathered from experience and their bodily senses? For they indeed have no acquaintance with any flesh but that which is mortal. And this is their whole argument, that what they have had no experience of, they judge quite impossible. For we cannot call it reasoning to make pain a presumption of death, while, in fact, it is rather a sign of life. This belief system and hellfire causes psychological harm for both kids and adults, and so the replacement for that should be the ideas of universalism, that is to say, that anybody, no matter their background, is saved directly by God, and so I would suggest the Christians watching this video to replace the ideas of hellfire because it's not supported by the text, it's psychologically damaged, and so I think the best option for you guys to actually do is to use the ideas of universalism. My second to last idea is to get rid of the idea of original sin. According to many biblical scholars, the idea of original sin simply does not exist. The main reason why the idea of original sin is so popular again comes directly from the doctrine of St. Augustine. Yet because this feeling of his is neither sweet with pleasure nor wholesome with repose, but painfully penal, it is not without reason called death rather than life. And it is called the second death because it follows the first, which sunders the two cohering essences, whether these be gods and the soul, or the soul and the body. Of the first and bodily death, then, we may say that to the good it is good, and evil to the evil. But, doubtless, the second, as it happens to none of the good, so it can be good for none. 3. Whether death, which by the sin of our first parents has passed upon all men, is the punishment of sin, even to the good. But a question not to be shirked arises, whether in very truth death, which separates soul and body, is good to the good. For if it be, how has it come to pass that such a thing should be the punishment of sin? For the first men would not have suffered death had they not sinned. How, then, can that be good to the good, which could not have happened except to the evil? Then again, if it could only happen to the evil, to the good it ought not to be good, but non-existent. For why should there be any punishment where there is nothing to punish? Wherefore we must say that the first men were indeed so created, that if they had not sinned, they would not have experienced any kind of death, but that, having become sinners, they were so punished with death, that whatsoever sprang from their stock should also be punished with the same death. My final suggestions for Christians is to actually make sure that requirement is not needed to believe in God to be part of the Christian religion. I know this is like the most controversial of the bunch, but yeah, make sure it's not a requirement to believe in God for someone to be part of that community. Because people have noted the benefits of community and churches, having people that are like-minded like you is actually a good idea, and so don't make it a requirement to believe in God to be part of the church. To recap everything I said, we need to have community centers, we need critical thinking classes, get rid of the faculties at the college campuses, and also have classic and logic and encourage the ideas of the Socratic methods. And finally, for the Christian side of things, you need to make sure to not have original sin, no ideas of hellfires, don't require belief in God, and so I hope everything is pretty much covered within this video. But what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.